Come, good fellows, let us take our first glass. <laughs> Tonight's sermon will be three hours long. And for the wise guy that put this here, you're going to have to pronounce all the names in Aramaic I'm going to read tonight. That's the Puritans. Last week we talked about those guys. <laughs> I laughed about that throughout the whole song service. That's good. Whoever did that, and I have a suspicion as to who it was, that's really good. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. <laughs> Can someone turn that glass again in about an hour? Uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, we'll read the first eight verses again. Nehemiah 8, 1, and all the people gathered as one man at the square, which is in the front of the water gate, and they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday. In the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium or platform which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood 13 guys, right hand and left hand. I think, the more I think about those 13 guys in verse uh, 4, I think I had this feeling those guys helped Ezra read. They took turns reading, but that's just my theory. Verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands, and they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, 13 other guys, Levites, explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. They read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1 to 8, we are talking about the exposition of the word. That's the subject. This, there's really not one aspect to, to teaching, to biblical teaching. It's not just about the guy who's speaking. It's also about the people who are listening. That's a very important aspect. If they're not seriously tuned in to the message, and we talked about this last week, then the application will be lacking. But last week we saw that the people in Ezra's time were very eager to listen uh, to the scripture, they wanted the word to, so they could hear it, and they participated in two ways. First of all, by voluntarily and willingly assembling together. It's as if they called themselves, is the wording, the way the wording reads in verse 1, together for this occasion, they motivated themselves. And secondly, they showed their participation, and they were willing participants, through their desire to hear the word. They desired to hear the word greatly. They told Ezra, bring the book. Uh, literally, they didn't ask him in verse 1. Literally, the word is they said to him, you know, Ezra, bring the book. And they wanted it read. Uh, and when they heard it read, their listening chills, skills were off the chart. They listened to it uh, uh, patiently <clears throat> for five, six hours. They listened to it from daybreak till midday. They listened to it attentively. They listened to it reverently as they were there, and they showed great respect for the Word of God, so they actively participated in the reading of the Word. I was asked after the message last week, how can we become better listeners of the Word? And I just want to give a, a handful of, of practical suggestions as to how we can become better listeners, listeners of the Word, and we'll move on. Number one, make sure you're spending time daily in the Word yourself, so you can get, get attuned to listening, whether it's audibly Listening to the scripture, a lot of people do that today, or whether it's uh, reading it yourself, you're getting used to hearing the word of God, and when you come to the service, you're in the practice of it already. Number two, go to sleep at a reasonable time on Saturday night. You, know, you can't believe the people I've talked to that I found out the problem is they're staying up half the night on Saturday night, uh, you know, entertainment and all that. And so go to sleep at a reasonable time, get up at a reasonable time Sunday morning, so you can have, start preparing your heart to hear the word. You won't be worn out, and you can listen. Number three, if it helps you to concentrate, take notes. You can track along with the notes as you're taking. Okay, write it down. You're listening more intently that way if it helps you. And number four, anticipate distractions. Um, you know, if there's going to be distractions. Babies are going to cry in the service. People are going to distract you in other ways. 
Just realize it's going to happen. Do the best you can. So the listener has a responsibility. They need, to, they need to know that they have responsibilities. You know, we always put it on the guy up here, but they have responsibilities as well to listen carefully. On the other side of the coin, there is the responsibility of the teacher. The responsibility of the teacher. Now, I could use the word privilege also. Responsibility, both are true. Uh, but what does, what does the teacher of the word do? What does he do? Well, first of all, he helps people to exalt the Lord. He exalts the Lord. Look at verse 5. Ezra opens the book, all the people stand up. Verse 6, Ezra blesses the Lord, the great God, all the people answered, Amen. And it goes on like that. When the book is open, the people stand up to show respect for the Word of God. Why? Because the Word is sacred. Why is the Word sacred? Because it comes from God who is sacred. And He has given it His authority. In fact, 2 Timothy 3.15 says, it calls the Scriptures in the NASB, the sacred writings. Or it could be translated the Holy Scripture, either way. Uh, but this is a word that possesses divine authority and knowledge of the word. If you have knowledge of the word, that will, lead, that will lead you to a knowledge of the Lord. And when you understand who he is in all his glory, then what do you do? You worship, right? You give him exaltation. The person who leads in this exaltation of the Lord is Ezra. He blesses the Lord and the people follow his lead. Know what he's, see what he's called there in verse 6? He's called the great God. There's none like him. He alone is God. He alone is great. Everyone that day realizes that truth by their response, their reactions. You can see it. Oh, here's something to keep in mind. A high view of Scripture will lead to a high view of God. And a high view of God will lead to a high view of Scripture in turn. And anyone who thinks that the Scripture is deficient in any way at all will have a warped view of God. They won't have a high view of God. They don't have a high view of Scripture. But if we know him, if we can see him as the Scripture presents him, then will recognize this is the great God. And, and that's going to result in our exalting him. That's how it works. Now watch how the people continue to respond. They answer in verse 5, they answer, or verse 6 rather, amen, amen. Uh, they, they agree, they affirm, yes, God is worthy. God is great. God is, uh, is the one that we, should be, be, that we should bless. They lift their hands in praise to acknowledge his worth. They bow low and worship with their faces to the ground. Obviously, a display of humility, a display of submission to the Lord. They want to submit to his, his will. And uh, it's not just some of the people doing this, not just a handful over here. I used to go to a place, I just thought of this, uh, uh, the first college I went to, allegedly a college, the guys, uh, the guy, the Bible college, the guys that were the, the amen corner, so-called, would, they were really up front, you know, those guys. They were kind of scattered everywhere, but the guys that were really into it were sitting up front. Man, they were coming out with some serious amens and hallelujahs and all kinds of stuff. It was just nonstop. Uh, that's not what this is here. These guys, it says not just some of the people, verse 6 says, it's all the people answered, amen, amen. They all lift their hands. They're all bowing down. This is a unified exaltation of God. Now think about that. How many times in Israel's history has this happened? When you read through the Old Testament, you see a lot of disobedience, right? A lot of going away from God, a lot of idolatry. Not that they never worship God, but man, everybody, all at the same time, together in unison. So unusual. Now, we emphasize the need, and, I, and I'm all for this, in our service to stand when we have the reading of the Word. We, we, you know, we stand for that, and that's great practice. I love to practice. I've always loved that practice. Uh, and we emphasize that. But how many times have you heard anybody in a church service emphasize the need to, okay, let's all bow down low to the ground with our faces to the ground and worship? Has anybody ever been in a service like that? And these aren't Muslims, okay? <laughs> they, that's not going to happen for several centuries. These are God's people who are doing this. But if we truly understand the nature of God, and if we truly understand the nature of Scripture, and if the Scripture is preached truly and seriously, that will lead to the exaltation of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's what it will lead to. If we preach the word accurately, if we preach the word, uh, period, the Lord is going to be exalted. So the first responsibility of the, the teacher, we could say, is to exalt the Lord. And people, in turn, get the idea, hey, we need to exalt the Lord. Secondly, to read the word. Read the word, verse 3. He read from it, from the law of Moses, before the square, half the day, or till, till, till midday. 
And uh, verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God, it says. In order to expound the word, we must read the word. That's part of what we're doing in, in a message. That's why we like expository preaching. And in an expository sermon, you're either reading the word, explaining the word, exhorting the word, or applying the word. But it's always about the word. The focus is always on the word. That's where it always is. Uh, the sermon is all about the word. Walter Kaiser, a, 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 an Old Testament scholar, used to teach uh, preaching classes uh, for Old Testament. And he said, he would always tell his students, now, if you're, if you're uh, preaching, he says, and you're ge gesturing with your right hand, keep your left hand on the text, point to the text. And if you're gesturing with your left hand, keep your right hand always on the text. Always have your finger pointing to the text. Can you do that, Mike? Always keep your finger there without stopping the whole sermon. You're always, that way you're always pointing to the scriptures. Now, that sounds crazy probably. I don't think we're going to, we have to do that. But I get his point. His point is point people to the word of God always. That's what we're always doing. There's no other message. The scriptures are message. What, what other message do we have here? Why are we here outside of that? I've, well, I've heard some weird things in my life in sermons, many, many weird things. And I often wonder why are we here if we're not preaching the word? Now, the word read, read in verses 3 and 8 actually means to call or proclaim. And so Ezra and the Levites are literally proclaiming the word of God by, as they read it out loud. That's what they're doing. This is a pure proclamation. A pure proclamation because it's the word of God they're reading, nothing else at this point. It's just the pure word itself. Now, the word needs to be explained, but it needs to be read first and read, read again and again. I, I love the practice we have here, by the way, of, of the two sermon, of the two readings we have, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We only had one at the beginning, then Ryan suggested, as a matter of fact, we do too. We've done that ever since, so that was a great suggestion. But right after his temptation, Jesus, when he started his earthly ministry, he went into a synagogue, and that's recorded in Luke 4, and it says there that what, one of the things he did was he read the scriptures publicly. Luke 4, 16 and 17 says, Jesus entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read. He stood up to read and they handed the book of the, uh, of the, the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and he opened the book and he found the place where it was written. I don't know how that was through the scroll. Let's see, here's chapter 61. There's no chapters, no verses. And he proceeds to read Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Then he begins to talk about the fulfillment of that scripture, but he first reads. Later, Paul is going to give instructions about pre reading, and one of the best verses on preaching in the New Testament, in my opinion, 1 Timothy 4.13. Paul says, until I come, give attention to the reading, to exhortation, and to teaching. When he says reading, he's talking about the public reading of scripture. We read it publicly, which is followed by exhortation and, and teaching. Now you say, well, that's a Seems to be a no-brainer. It seems very simple what you just said. Yeah, it is simple. Until you hear the average sermon preached in America. And you realize, wow, why aren't these guys doing this? I never forget. I was thinking while I was going through this, I was thinking about a. We were in, uh, on vacation one time. And we went to a Methodist church because the family there went to a Methodist church. They took us to this place. We heard a guy read a verse. I still, it was in 1 Corinthians. I still remember the verse. He reads the verse beginning the message and, and proceeds to leave the scripture alone, never to be seen again throughout the message. But that's so typical in this country. A verse may be read like that at the beginning of the sermon, and then they depart from that and they go on to talk about who knows what. It's been likened to like the national anthem before a ball game. The national anthem is sung before the ball game, never sung again during the game. That's the end of it, right? That's how a lot of preaching is. We don't want to do preaching like that. We don't want to be like that. So we read the word, right? We exalt the Lord. We are to read the word. We are to, furthermore, third, explain the word. Explain the word. This is, this is the missing element, probably. This is probably the missing element in preaching across the board, across this country, across the world. This is probably the biggest, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think this may be the biggest missing element of all. Now, back in 1980, when I was going to Clearwater Christian College, I was, you know, that long, the drive over the water, over the causeway and all that. I was listening to the radio, and uh, I was listening to Moody Radio back then, and uh, it was not like Moody Radio is today, but I was listening, and I, and I turned it on, and I heard this guy preaching. 
And the way he went about his message was he was going verse by verse through a passage of Scripture. And I thought, this is strange. And I listened another day, and he did it again. He preached through the next passage. I think he was in Matthew, I believe. And every time I listened to this guy, he did the same thing. He, would, he kept going through the same book of the Bible, verse by verse, explaining the text in its context. And I thought to myself, what kind of new teaching is this? I never heard this. I'd heard all kinds of, you can't even believe what I've heard, all kinds of stuff, you know. Never heard this before. And I said, you know, this makes sense to me. This guy is working his way through the text, through the scriptures, through a book, and when he gets done, guess what? I understand what it means. I was flabbergasted. I think, oh, that's what that means. I never knew that before. I was just flabbergasted, and I, and I thought, how come I've never heard this before? Well, because nobody does it, that's why. That man was John MacArthur. And I tell you, I found out later he was preaching expositorily. What's that? <laughs> and uh, he, the, that is where you make, which I'll go into a lot of detail, that's where they make the scripture text the main focus in its context. That's how it should be. And that's what he was doing. That's how we should be doing it. According to verse 7 and 8, they, they explain the text, but this explanation becomes a team effort. In verse 7, the Levites get involved. You see that? They get involved, and they explain the law to the people while the people remain in their place. That word, explain there, means what you think it does to cause people to understand, to help them to understand. Probably what happened was, I'm assuming, the Levites were moving through the crowd. There was a big crowd. They, like I said last week, estimates of 30 to 50,000 people listening. Think about that. Uh, kind of like a Joel Osteen crowd. And... Uh, the people, probably the Levites, were moving through the crowd, I'm guessing, explaining to groups here and there, hey, this is what he means by this. Just a practical way to approach a large crowd. And that, in that time period, nobody had an open mic here or a microphone that worked or anything like that. Verse, look at verse 8. They read from the book of the law, from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. Notice the word translating. Now, if you have an, an, uh, a New American Standard Bible... And you have the notes, which are, by the way, those notes are really good. They're literal renderings on the side column or in the middle column. It says in your uh, Bible, or explaining, translating or explaining. Let me comment on that briefly because, as they say, much ink has been spilt over this particular word. Some take this to mean, when it says translating, that's how the NASB took it, translating, and this is a great translation, the Levites translated from the Hebrew Bible into Aramaic. The reasoning goes like this to the people. They had the Hebrew Bible, and they translated from that to the people so they could understand it in Aramaic. The reason is they say the Jews had been in captivity for 70, 70 years, which is true. They had been. Well, they spoke Aramaic over there in Babylon. And so the, the Jews in captivity lost their ability to speak the Hebrew language. And so they would have to have this translated to understand because, you know, if it's being read in Hebrew, which it was, then the people were, hey, we speak Aramaic, we don't get it. Therefore, the Levites went out and translated in Aramaic. The only problem with this view is this. Books were written after the captivity, like Ezra, which does have parts in Aramaic. It's Hebrew and Aramaic. But Nehemiah was written during the time, after the captivity, which is all Hebrew. Esther was, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, written in Hebrew. Outside, you know, and so if the people after the exile could not understand Hebrew, then why was it written in Hebrew? That's a, a problem uh, in my view. Now, the basic meaning of this word, and this is what I lean towards, uh, is actually, it actually means to make distinct, to make distinct or to make clear. And I'm sure that Ezra read the text distinctly, carefully, and clearly, and that the Levites explained each section as they read. Some people put the emphasis on this meaning on going through different sections, paragraph by paragraph, to understand the meaning. Uh, and I think that's what they did. They explained section after section of the law to these people. And it took a lot of time, probably, because there are thousands of people. The bottom line is, whether they translated this or, or whether they just explained this, the bottom line is this, they clarified the reading. That's what the context is all about. They clarified the reading. They gave clarity. Isn't that, this is one of the key principles. When Mike first came to this church, he talked about, the, I think, about four key principles in preaching. One of those was clarity. Again and again, he talked about clarity. 
They, they explained the Bible, the Levites did, so the people could understand the Bible. That's what they did. And verse 8 tells us the happy outcome they had. Look at verse 8, the end of it. They understood the reading. They understood the reading. That's a great achievement in preaching, by the way. If you teach the scripture on any level to toddlers, to uh, teenagers, to uh, adults, whoever, your goal is to make it clear and understandable. Let me repeat. The goal in preaching is to make it clear and understandable. That's what we want to do. Well, there's other goals, but that's what we want to do. It's one of the goals. We don't want to keep people in the dark. What do you think happened? Why do you think they called that the dark ages? One reason is they kept people in the dark regarding the Bible until the light of the Reformation shone through and people faithfully expounded the word and people said, oh, yeah, now I see. Now I understand. What good does it do if people do not understand the Bible that we are teaching? Very, very important. There was a pastor, I've talked about this man before, a pastor in Aberdeen, Scotland, years, uh, some years, not long ago, but he preached for 50 years in Scotland by the name, his name was William Still, or as I like to call him, Will Still, the pastor. On one Sunday, a visitor came to his church, and he met with the pastor after the service. He heard him preach. He wanted to meet him after the service. He met him after the service, and he, wanted to, he had some concerns about William Still's preaching, and he said to William Still, but you don't preach. The problem is you don't preach. And the pastor was taken back, and he says, what do you mean I don't preach? And the guy said, all you do is take a passage of Scripture and explain it. And William Still said, brother, that is preaching. That is preaching. And that, I think, is the missing element in preaching, very important. Now, explanation is not the only thing. In, communi in communicating the truth, but it is vitally important. Without explanation, there is no true preaching. Spurgeon said, brethren, there must be the element of teaching in your sermons. You have to have that. But to bring it to our time, Ezra and his companions were taking an ancient text, right, the ancient words of Scripture. Even at that time, it was an ancient text. And they were explaining it to a post-exilic generation, after the exile, they're explaining to these people, here's what the text means, here's what it says, here's what it means, you should apply this text. They did that. Today, think about the connection here. After all these thousands of years, today, we are taking this same ancient text and we're explaining it to whom? To the postmodern generation. We're explaining it to them. I hope they're listening. But nothing has changed in the method we do the same thing today they did back then. We simply read the text. We explain the text. We have the goal of applying the text. Ezra did not read the text and explain the text just so as an academic exercise. He meant for it to affect the lives of the people. That was his end goal. So we have the exposition of the word in the first eight verses. Secondly, the response to the word in verses 9 to 12. The response to the word, verse 9. Then Nehemiah, who was the governor... And Ezra, this priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of, this, of the law. Then he said to them, Go, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. All the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival because they understood the words which had been made known to them. Now, what about application? All I've heard is so far as they read and they explained. Did these people fail on the application part? They did not. Their hearts are clearly affected by what they've heard. As You, know, you can see that they're weeping. Uh, because of what they've heard. They've, they're weeping because of the words of the law they've heard. Now, weeping alone is not enough. It's not enough. Uh, it must be turned into positive action towards the Lord. There must be full repentance. Repentance involves a change of mind leading to a change of life. That's what we want to, we want to have. We don't want to be like the guy who received the seed on the, you know, the rocky places. And he was all emotional about it, as we've seen this happen. I've seen it happen many times in my life. And then, but in this, his case... It was the, the emotions were devoid of the truth. He didn't have it rooted in his heart. He didn't have true salvation because when affliction and persecution came, he, he fell away. 
But I believe these people here are convicted by what they hear. The Word of God read and explained showed them that they had, uh, they had sinned against God. They had fallen short of the glory of God. They saw that. Again, very important how you hear the Word of God. Again, it's very important that you sit under a ministry, wherever it is, that they're explaining the Word of God to people. <clears throat> and that you have a heart ready to uh, make, you know, to submit to God's will. The exposition, the exposition of the word is not an academic exercise, like I said. It's intended to affect the heart and the life. Now, look, the word, look at the word taught in verse 9, the Levites who taught the people. That word is translated explain in verse 7, same word, but it can be, you know, explain, cause to understand, teach, whatever. And the Levites did a great job of that. And, of course, Ezra, the spiritual leader, is playing his role in this, and he's leading this whole thing. Look who else is here all of a sudden. We haven't heard about him in this chapter. Nehemiah the governor is here. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so, and I believe in verse 9 and 10, he's the one speaking. Nehemiah the governor is the one speaking. He's the leader of the whole, uh, whole area. So you have the civic leader, Nehemiah, and the spiritual leader, Ezra, t t together in their support of the scriptures being read and taught. <clears throat> and Nehemiah reminds the people, this is a special day. This is a holy day. It's the day the Old Testament talks about that we're to worship. God, this whole week, seven, eight days, and we're to have, we should be rejoicing on this day. Now, he's not trying to undermine their repentance, their tears of maybe sadness because they didn't, they saw in the scripture where they have disobeyed it for maybe centuries even. He's not trying to kill their repentance. He's just going by Leviticus 23, Deuteronomy 16, which says, hey, this is a day, these are days set aside to rejoice in God's goodness. To celebrate a feast is a time to thank God for what he's done. <clears throat> Isn't it interesting as a believer, you can have both. You can go from one moment to uh, crying, weeping over your sin, to a next moment of rejoicing because God is good and God's forgiven us of our sins. Nehemiah says, look, go eat, celebrate. This is the day to rejoice. Then Nehemiah makes one of the greatest statements in the Bible. I love this statement in verse 10 at the end of the verse. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. What a great statement. Now, this is not joy in and of itself. That's not where the strength comes from. People can set out with a determined mindset, hey, I'm going to be happy today. I'm going to be positive today. I'm going to take a positive attitude today. And that's not, we're not talking about a self-induced joy here. Strength doesn't come from that. You know, I read a statement by J.I. Packer who said about this verse, well, get this. He said Adolf Hitler took this verse from Nehemiah and lifted the phrase out, lifted a phrase out, strength through joy, and made it the motto of the Hitler Youth Movement. I want you guys to follow this motto. I didn't tell, I mean, I don't know if he told me he got from the Bible or not. That's just a perversion of the truth here. We're not talking about strength through joy. We're talking about the Lord, the joy of the Lord being our strength. That's a different matter, right? That's not just a motivational tool. We're talking about God's joy. That's where the strength comes from. We're to rejoice in the Lord always, it says in the New Testament. The key is to rejoice what? In the Lord, right? The key is to rejoice in the Lord. Circumstances may be very troubling to us, may be very difficult for us to go through. I think Barnabas this morning talked about the man who lost his wife and he said, I never would have made it had it not been for the Lord being there for me. Maybe very difficult, but his joy can give us strength to carry on, even in grieving situations. Jesus said in John 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. We're talking about fullness of joy, the joy that carries us through the difficulties of life. The result of all this in verse 10 is kind of breaks out into a, Kind of a Baptist-like fellowship. They eat a lot of food. Requirement, right, for that? They eat to their heart's content. And they celebrate. They have a good time. They rejoice. They should rejoice because God is good. And verse 12, very interesting, lets us know this joy also stemmed from the fact that they actually understood the word of God. Verse 12, they understood the words which had been made known to them, and they're celebrating as a result. This is cause for rejoicing. Because you understand the words of, of the scripture, right? Again, I don't know why people insist 
on going to a church where the Word of God is not seriously taught and explained, I do not understand that. What joy is there in that? What accurate application is there in that? What is the purpose of the message? The joy is hearing, is in hearing and understanding and doing. That's where the joy comes from. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I, I want to know, and I'm sure a lot of folks here want to know, as Ephesians 1 said, says, what is the hope of his, of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? Well, we want to know all these things, right? So we can live the life that God wants us to, so we can please him as he wants to be pleased. How are we going to know this? How are we going to hear without a preacher? And how are we going to hear unless the preacher explains to us, right? The people respond as they should in this case. Then in verses 13 to 18, thirdly, we have a, a specific application of the word. A specific application of the word, verse 13. Then on the second day, the heads of the father's households, of all the people, the priests, and the Levites were gathered to Ezra the scribe that they might gain insight into the words of the law. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. So they proclaimed and circulated a proclamation in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the hills and bring olive branches and wild olive branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his, own, each on his roof, and in their courts, and in the courts of the house of God, and the square of the water gate, at the water gate, and the square at the gate of Ephraim, the entire assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in them. The sons of Israel had indeed not done so from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day. And there was great rejoicing. He read from the book of the law of God daily from the first day to the last day. And they celebrated the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. This is the second day, second consecutive day of this time, the Feast of Trumpets, and then we launched, and it may have been a little bit different from the original uh, uh, time periods of the, uh, of the law, but they launched into the Feast of Booths. But this, on this second day, there are many people absent uh, from the large crowds of the first day. There's no, if you'll notice carefully in verse 13, there are no women, there are no children. On the second day, the audience is made up only of men. The heads of father's household, the priest, the Levites, Ezra, only the men were there. Why? It doesn't say, but it's been suggested that there was, such, uh, there was such, so much going on on the first day that they were exhausted, standing for five, six hours. Think about this in a practical way. I can see this happening. Standing for five or six hours with small children, feasting afterwards, fellowshipping, uh, all this time, you, you devote that whole day, people are exhausted, and they, it was felt they could stay home. That's a suggestion that's offered by many. I can well believe that's true, by the way. I can see it happening today, right? Think about this for a minute, right? We're exhausted. We're not going to do anything tomorrow. But the men were expected to be there the second day. They are there. But if you think about it, who in the family is responsible for the spiritual leadership? It's the men, ultimately, right? The fathers, the husbands. The men should take responsibility for the spiritual instruction in their homes. Doesn't this cause us to think of Deuteronomy 6, which talks about, you know, teaching your children along the way, the scriptures. And uh, Deuteronomy 6 says the word, that the words of scripture are to be taught diligently to your sons. Deuteronomy 6, 2 says it is, it is so that you, the heads of households, and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord and keep his commandments. That's why you teach them the scriptures. That's why you bring this before them. God has entrusted the parents with this great responsibility of instructing their children, especially the husbands and the fathers. Are you listening, men? This is the burden laid upon us. We're called to be the example and to take the spiritual leadership of the home. Uh, you know, we're, we're not required to be Bible scholars. We're simply required to be spiritual leaders in the home. Under God, the best we can, be men of the word the best we can, and if we haven't done so, we need to start. It's always a time to start if you haven't done that. That's on us. But these men had their spiritual appetite stirred the first day they were there. 
And they wanted to know more of God's word. They were interested in knowing more of it. Verse 13, at the end of it says, they wanted to gain insight, that they might gain insight into the words of the law. They're not satisfied with only the first day of six hours. Now, most people after that, they'd be done for. It'd be over with. I'm not coming back. That guy's long-winded, you know. He's got the hourglass. He's turned it over six times already. We're not doing all that. We're not good fellows anymore either. We're not coming back. But these people are back. They're ready for more. They want to hear it. The Apostle Peter later, later is going to say about this desire, this thirst for the word, hunger and thirst for the word, he's going to say like newborn babies, right? Desire the, the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, that you may grow in relationship to salvation. That's something we cannot let fall by the wayside. We can't, we, we can't let, we've got to cultivate our desire for the word because I will tell you that Satan, the world, and your own flesh will see to it that that desire fades over time. They will see to that. They'll try to end it if they can, all three enemies. That's why we have to, it's a battle. That's why we have to fight again and again and again, cultivating this desire until death. The desire to hear the word and, and to be an obedient to the word. In verse 14, look at verse 14. Their pursuit of the word leads them to a new discovery. They found written. They found it as they're going through the law. They found something. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the second month. That comes from Leviticus 23, that information. They came across Leviticus 23, and they realized, hey, we're supposed to be living in booths during the feast of booths. We're supposed to be doing this. Now, verse 17 says, Israel had not celebrated in this way, the feast of booths, since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun. Does that mean the last time the feast of booths was celebrated was during the days of Joshua? No. Because there are scattered references in 2 Chronicles that says it was celebrated under Solomon. It was celebrated under Hezekiah, under Josiah. And in Ezra 3, 4, you'll see it celebrated again, the Feast of Booths. So what's different? <clears throat> it could be based on the content of these verses. It could be that they had the making of, of the actual booths had lapsed. That they weren't doing that part of the... They were just going through the feast and the rest of it, but not really making the booths. Because this is difficult. This is, the, as one guy put it, the camping out element of this whole thing. There's this emphasis in verses 14 through 17 that this is about, about this whole business of living out. You know, they had to, it took effort to collect, the, they had to collect branches of all kinds, and of various kinds. And then they had to put a lean-to together, kind of a makeshift booth, to spend seven days kind of camping out in this situation. It says some did this, some made this on the roofs. You ever camped out on your roof? I had a neighbor camp out across the street when we had a, uh, the storm uh, some years ago. The hurricane knocked out the power in our area for four days. He slept on his, uh, uh, his hammock outside. I'm not so sure he didn't sleep on the roof, too. But some put it on the roof. Some put it were in the courts. Some made up their booth in front of the water gate. Can you imagine living seven days like this in a makeshift booth? No refrigerator, no air conditioner. No luxuries, no, what, what, what we really, we call them conveniences. Actually, they're luxuries in some parts of the world. Maybe many of them couldn't imagine it either, and they didn't do it throughout their history. Like, well, we'll just go through the celebration here, but we're not going to go to all that trouble, okay? That's a little bit much. Come on, really? Seven days in this makeshift tent? Maybe they didn't celebrate to the full extent all those years. But if you think about it, if you actually did this, you did this, and you're, and you're in Israel, and, and, they, and you had to celebrate the Feast of Booth, and you put this lean-to together for seven days. You, were, you have a vivid reminder, a great object lesson, that this, is, this, is, this goes back to the wilderness wanderings, that when they were in the wilderness wanderings, God took care of them. They didn't have anything. God had to provide for them like manna from heaven. God took care of them in this kind of existence. They were in total dependence upon him, so it would remind you in a vivid way this is how it was. We didn't have anything, but God took care of us. So these people make the application. They do what he says. They gather the materials. They build the lean-tos. They celebrate the festival the way God wants them to do that. Now, it's always exciting to, to find a new truth in the Bible, isn't it? Discover something you haven't seen before, and, wow, this is something I haven't seen. This is great, but it's always even better to work that truth into your lifestyle and actually live it because the mere discovery of truth is not an end in itself. 
It has to lead to something, lead to application, right? What's the result of their obedience in verse 17? <clears throat> verse 17, the end of the verse says, what's the last phrase, last sentence say? And there was great rejoicing. There was great rejoicing. That's where the obedience to the Lord leads to great rejoicing. Now you say, well, that's Old Testament stuff. Yeah, but Jesus said much the same in John 15. He associates obedience with joy in John 15. So you can see this emphasis on joy in this passage, verses 13 to 18, verses 9 to 18 for that matter. Joy comes when we expose ourselves to the word of God and gladly do what the Lord wants. That's a very important concept to grasp. This concept of, of this connection between joy and the word of God. Verse 18, he read from the book of the law of God daily from the first day to the last day. They celebrated the feast seven days. So seven days of reading the law. Now, there's a lot of discussion about on the first day, what exactly did Ezra read? And maybe his 13 guys with him, maybe. What did these guys read? Uh, what, what was it they read exactly? Did they read the whole Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible? We talked about this last week. Did they cover just certain portions of it? I was thinking about this, and it occurred to me, a new theory <laughs> that's arisen in the land. Uh, maybe somebody... Somebody's probably thought of this many times, but I thought to myself, wait a minute. Who says they had to read it all the first day? What if, they, since they read it for seven days, what if they started on day one and began the beginning and it took seven days to read the whole thing with explanation? Maybe that happened. I don't know. I don't know how much they spent, how much time they spent on every day after the first day, it doesn't say. Maybe it took them the whole seven days to read the, the entire law and explain it. The important thing is they applied what they were learning. They apply the whole feel of this chapter is these people are excited about the word. They want to hear the word. They want to understand the word. Their hearts are affected by the word, and they apply the word when they hear it. George Mueller said concerning the word of God, it's not just a simple reading of the word so that it only passes through our minds, just as water passes through a pipe, but considering what we read, pondering over it, and applying it to our hearts. This is what happened in the spiritual awakening in Nehemiah 8. It's a spiritual awakening. It's going to continue in chapter 9. And it's what happened at other times in church history. You can go back and read and see what happened in the Great Awakenings and all these different occasions, 1904, 1905, in the United Kingdom and different places, the great revivals that took place. And it can happen in our... You say, well, that was back then. That was back in Nehemiah's time. That was back maybe... And in the, you know, the Great Awakenings, but not now. This is you know, the 21st century America. Nobody does this anymore. Who says it's got to change now? It can happen in our own lives if we'll give ourselves to the Word of God. There's no difference in the time periods. Just like this period, let, let's let our hearts be affected like the people did in Nehemiah 8. And I think that's what it all is all about. When this happens, God is glorified by this mentality of, I want to hear the Word. I want to understand the word. I want to apply the word. I want it to affect my heart so I can do what God says, so I can please him. This, he's pleased with this mentality. He's pleased with this activity. I think he simply wants us to be people of his word. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful again for your word. Uh, we pray that uh, we will be people of the word, Lord. Our hearts are prone to wander so often and go away from your word and do things that we want to do, do our own thing. Lord, give us an incline, as the psalmist prayed, incline our hearts to your word so that we'll be men and women of the word, children of the word, that will follow your word, help us to live your word by your grace so we might do your work. And again, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.